All right, so we're in Galatians 2 this morning. That's where we continue our study in this summer road trip to freedom. And it's a fascinating passage we'll get into today. Um, So much as I said to see, and uh, God just keeps helping me see things in different ways here. But we will start, (coughs) we will start here. When Hunter Shamet lost his wallet, he had little hope he'd get it back. Certainly not with interest, but he did. Hunter was on the way from South Dakota to his sister's wedding in Las Vegas when he left his wallet on the airplane. It held the 20-year-old's ID and debit card as well as $60 and a signed paycheck. Hunter was fearing the worst that everything was gone, his mother Jeannie Shamet wrote in a Facebook post. Luckily, Todd Brown, the man who found it, is a believer in paying it forward. He mailed mailed everything back, and then some. Brown included a note that read, Hunter found this on a frontier flight from Omaha to Denver, wedged between the seat and the wall. Thought you might want it back. All the best. P.S. I rounded your cash up to an even hundred dollars so you could celebrate getting your wallet back. Have fun. That's right. What others, while others might have snatched the cash, Brown gave the kids some more. I saw he was just a kid, 20 years old. He had a paycheck in there, so I figured, well, he's doing his best to make ends meet. I was 20 once, and that's a lot of money for a kid, Brown reasoned. He decided not to give the wallet to the flight crew. I thought about it, but I just wanted to make sure he got it back. Brown told Yahoo Lifestyle. Jeannie posted again on Facebook to gush about Brown. I personally want to thank Todd Brown for restoring faith that there are amazing people out there. The world is not as grim as it's being made out to be, she wrote. Brown never expected to get so much attention. I just wanted to do the right thing. It, is, oh, it always feels good to do the right thing. That comes from Yahoo News about a, year, a couple years ago. So I thought about that, right? That is a great story, is it not? That's a great story. And it's, we love story, inspirational stories, make great sermon illustrations, do they not? <clears throat> so I was thinking about the story and I thought, you know, maybe we read too much into those stories sometimes. Maybe we read too much. Think about it like this. Let's, let's take another hypo, hypothetical story. Let's take Joy. And Joy works <clears throat> at uh, the bank and one of her coworkers, not a good friend, just an acquaintance at the bank, she comes down and she needs a kidney transplant. So Joy says, you know, I'm going to give her a kidney. Hardly even knows her. And she gives, Joy gives this coworker a kidney. What an amazing story, right? <laughs> wow, that's such an inspirational story. Certainly that can fit into our message somewhere to, to teach what? Because what if the person giving the kidney and the person returning the wallet have ulterior motives? What, what ulterior motives could they have? Well, What if, just think about it, what if sometimes good deeds can be bad news? What if the person doing that is thinking, well, I need to do enough good deeds so I can earn my salvation? Ooh. What what if they think, you know, I need to pay, you know, here's what's fascinating. These stories tell you very little about the person, like this, this guy that returned the wallet. Tells us nothing about him spiritually, although, okay, it does. Because in the, did you hear it in there? In the story it says, that he was a believer. He was a believer in paying it forward. <laughs> wasn't a believer in God or in Christ or in, he was a believer in karma and paying it forward. And what if sometimes the people that do these great deeds are just trying to earn their way to heaven and the good deeds are really bad news. See, the fact of the matter is anyone can be generous and show kindness. Anybody can. That's the reality. So those stories, they're inspirational and they're great. And yes, they encourage us, and yes, they, they make the world a better place to live in. But they say nothing about the true spiritual nature or reality of that person. Today, we're going to talk about the work of grace. Here's our big idea. The grace of God is the work of God in our life. The grace of God is the work of God in our life. We're going to talk about this idea of the work of grace. And that can sound very oxymoronic, right? Because, well, isn't, isn't grace the opposite of and the absence of work, right? Grace isn't, is about not working. Romans 4, 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are counted not as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. See, the reality is grace is the unmerited favor of God. 
And the truth is, we can never work hard enough to be good enough to make our dead spirits alive again. We just can't. There's no amount of work can ever get us right with God. No amount of work can ever get us right with God. And so we just need to be aware of that. We just need to know that. And so here's this, this idea of the work of grace, the work that grace does in our life. And grace does. And I, I think the issue is we need to sometimes think about grace. It's not some passive reality. It's not some inactive blessing in my life. Like, yeah, grace gives me all these spiritual blessings in Christ. True, it does. I mean, I'm adopted by the Father, I'm redeemed, I'm forgiven, I've got a future in heaven, I'm secure, in Christ, all of those great blessings. But grace is so much more. Grace is not a passive reality or an inactive blessing. Grace is an ongoing work of God in my life. Grace, <clears throat> it works for us and on us and in us and through us every single day. And it begins, of course, with our salvation, right? Right? God's grace forgives us, it saves us, it raises us back to life. Titus 2.11, here's what it says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, teaching, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for all, for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. And so you see the work there in that passage brings salvation, trains us for righteousness, causes us to be zealous for good works. Again, grace, it's working for us, it's working in us, it's working on us, it's working through us. Grace is the reason we can do all things through Christ. Grace is the reason we can run and not grow weary. Grace is the reason that we are strong when we are weak and grace is the very work that God is doing in us faithfully and will complete it one day when he returns. We're not just saved by grace through faith, we work out our salvation by grace through faith every single day. And so we come to Galatians 2 today, and as I said in the past, this, this might be Paul's first letter. It's one of his earliest letters. And in, the, and in the letter here, Paul's given some of his personal journey and his history. And one of the things in the letter too, Paul continues to make a very deliberate point that his gospel came from a revelation. He didn't get it from Peter or any of the other apostles. It came directly from Christ. And so he has this very specific message of grace. And today we're going to see that the grace of God is the work of God in our life. And we're going to see really four, just in in four examples of the work of grace in our life. And this will be very relatable as we get to the end of the message. It could get very personal and we could, could look inside ourselves and see some powerful things about the work of grace. But let's start here in verses, in chapter two, in the first three verses. And here's what it says. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running in vain or had not run in vain. First two verses there. And we see first that grace works in our relationships. Grace works in our relationships. And this is extremely practical. We all need God to work in our relationships, do we not? We can all find a relationship and say, boy, God needs to work in that relationship. Let's dig in here to the text. What's going on here? Well, again, let's start with the timeline. And Galatians 2 here, it it is either Paul's second trip to Jerusalem, found in Acts, the end of Acts 11, or it's his third trip, found in Acts 15. Tradition holds this is the Jerusalem council in Acts 15. But, There's a lot that debate that, and and if you get in and you really dig in and study it out, I actually tend to think it's probably the second trip. There's a lot of reasons why. We can't go into all that this morning. Regardless of whatever trip it is, this is what's going on. Paul was saved about a year after Pentecost in 34 to 35 AD. Uh, 15 years later, he takes his third trip to Jerusalem. That's the Jerusalem Council in AD 50. And so this either happens in AD 50 or a couple years earlier. What's, what, what Paul is describing to the, gen, to the Galatians here actually happened um, sometime at some other place and he's using this as a teaching example. 
Now here's the fact though, here's the, the issue. The Jewish Christians were struggling to work things out with their fellow Gentile Christians because again, remember the Jewish Christians, they've got all the Jewish stuff, right? And here come these Gentiles and as we said, they come to Christ, they get the gospel and uh, they're not given any of the Jewish any of the Jewish laws or customs. And so there's a struggle there that's going on between them. And so Paul has this meeting, he describes this meeting, and in this meeting, note that he goes first, he goes to these individuals in private. To those who are of influence, he goes and he meets them in private. And Paul did not want to embarrass these influential Jews publicly, so he goes to them, as he does. Doesn't want to embarrass them publicly. They, they may have been wrong, but they may have just been misinformed. They, they may just not have really understood what was going on. And you've got to, again, understand the dynamic for these Jewish believers. They're saved at Pentecost. They've got the law. They've got Moses. They've got circumcision, all of their Jewish customs. And now they've added Christ. And they haven't been told to, to leave all that behind. They've just now, Christ is their Messiah. They realize he is who he said he is. Some of these individuals were, were actually of the, of the Pharisee party. Sometimes they're called to the circumcision party. And so you got to understand for them, it's kind of difficult. This has been the norm for 1,500 years, and now there's all these people that are saved, and they don't have to do any of that. It's like, it's a little hard for them. So Paul goes to them, and he doesn't want to embarrass them publicly. Uh, Colossians 3, 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And that's Paul. That's what Paul's doing right there in this passage. He's living out that verse. He, 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 he showed them grace by going to them privately, behind closed doors. And think about this. Well, we'll look at Ephesians 4. Here's another verse, Ephesians 4. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as, as far as, the, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And the goal here by Paul is evident. It's not just to be proven right. His goal here is to encourage these Christians to, to build healthy relationships and to help them grow to spiritual maturity. And Paul wants the truth he teaches them to influence them so they can go out and influence. These are influential people. They need to go out and be an influence to the people around them. So the way he treats them, it is very, very, he doesn't embarrass them but he wants to teach them and he wants to influence them. In fact, what's going on here could be the Holy Spirit influencing Paul to make a very wise decision. Make a very wise decision, go to these individuals privately, and work these issues out with them and help them understand what's going on. Ecclesiastes 10, 12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor but the lips of a fool will consume him. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's acting very wisely and his words will win him favor. And the other thing Paul says here, he says that he, he, he wanted to do this in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So Paul does not want to undercut his ministry and uh, undermine his ministry and undercut his message. And so, and that's not on your handout, but that's just what's going on there. He doesn't want to undermine his ministry or undercut his message. And so Paul approaches them in grace. The bottom line here is if you want to test to see if grace is working in your life, look at your relationships and just see, is God working in my relationships? Are my words helpful? Are my words kind? Are they seasoned with salt? Do they build up or tear down? Do they speak wisdom? And there's a gift that Paul has here that we can all strive for in our relationships. Think about this gift, right? Aim for the gift where you are able to build someone up even while you are correcting them. That that's, can be a challenging thing, right? And that's what I think Paul is able to do, to build someone up while he corrects them. You're wrong, but I'm going to build you up in the process. I'm not going to tear you down. And so grace, we see grace working here in our relationships. Let's look at a second area this morning and remember again, the grace of God is the work of God in our life. Let's go on to verses 3 through 6. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seemed to be influential, 
What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. And so here, grace works to preserve the truth. Grace is working to preserve the truth. In fact, there's an inseparable relationship. I've explained it before between grace and truth. It really is. Truth and grace require each other. The, the fact of the matter is, if it weren't for God's truth, right here, the word of God, we would know nothing about what? His grace, his incredible love for us, his redemptive plan for us. We would know nothing about his grace. At the same time, without God's grace, he would have never given us what? His truth. His truth is a blessing. It is a gift from God. That he has explained to us our origins, where we come from and how we were made and how we were made in his image and how we fell and how he loved us and redeemed us. And so truth and grace, they are inseparable. They require each other. You can't take one and not have the other. That's just the way it works. Now here's the reality though. Grace is a threat to some people. Grace is a threat to some people. It is. Some people do not like the grace we have and the freedom it offers. To be honest, legalists, they don't like people to have a good time. It's like, if I'm not having a good time, you shouldn't have a good time. There's the story of the pastor got up. This is an old, old story. goes way back. Got up one Sunday to go to church in the olden days and it was snowed, snowed in, he couldn't get to church. Only way to get to church was to skate across the lake. So he skated the church. Well, horror of all horrors, the elder saw the pastor skating to church, and after the service called him in to reprimand him. He said, well, I, it was tough. I, I only had two choices, either stay home or skate to church. I'm like, oh. So they had a meeting about it. They came back and said, okay, did you enjoy yourself when you were skating? He said, no. He says, okay, you're all right then. Ain't crazy, right? The fact of the matter is, some people, they don't like us to see the, the, the freedom and the joy that grace can bring. Now, Paul identifies these men here as false brothers who slipped in to spy out our freedom we have in Christ Jesus. False brothers. Now, again, what are these false brothers? And, and the reality is Paul deals with different types of Jewish people. Most of the time, these Judaizers, that he, the, the Judaizers seem to be Christians. They, 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 they believe in Christ and the Messiah and the gospel. They just have all the Jewish stuff, and they're imposing that on the Gentiles. And so I do think the false brothers here are just like those Judaizers. And we see them repeatedly, though there were some unbelieving Jews that were causing havoc as well for Paul's ministry. But I think they're false brothers who just are kind of somewhat compromised in their message. They're compromised in their message because they're expecting all of these Gentiles to take on all of the, the Jewish burdens that, that they have. And so, yeah. I think they, they are who Paul talked about back in chapter 1. They have another gospel, a false gospel, a counterfeit gospel. In fact, the Enduring Word Commentary, David Yuzik says this, it is significant that Paul calls these men false brethren, a severe title. Of course, they did not think themselves as false brethren. They thought of themselves as true brethren. But because they opposed and contradicted the gospel revealed to Paul by Jesus Christ, they really were false brethren according to the standard of Galatians 1, 6 through 9. In Galatians 1, 8 and 9, remember this. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. We dealt with that back in uh, week two of this series. Strong words, and, and Paul, I, I think that's what these individuals are here. They believed in Jesus, they were part of the Jewish Christians from Pentecost, but they are failing to understand the new standard of grace that is being raised. I think what is often missed by most today in, 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 in the church is the, the understanding that there are two churches going on here at the same time, and one church is going to be fading out, and one church is going to be, be, be fading in. You have all these Jewish Christians, as, as I said, they're not told that they have to give up all their Jewish practices, they're not told they have to do that. But you have the people over here, and they're like, well, who's Moses? And what are the Ten Commandments? And when is the Sabbath? They know nothing of that. They, didn't, they haven't grown up with that. Over here, they have a 1,500-year year history with Moses. And they're not told to leave it all behind. But they are told to understand that these Gentile Christians have nothing to do with Moses, and they don't need to, they don't need to do all that Moses stuff. Because all we really need, right, is Christ. And Moses, as we saw, is supposed to point us to what? Christ. To who? Christ. 
And so that is what is going on. These two churches are going on. And this church over here, this Jewish church, eventually, and it does eventually, it fades away. Now there are Jews today, yeah, certainly that, that follow all the Jewish law and do that. Most of those, they don't believe in Christ as the Messiah. So that, that church has really pretty much faded. And, and again, here's the reality. All that's needed, the cross where Christ was offered for us and the resurrection where Christ was given to us. That's all we need today. That's it. That's the gospel. And here's the thing. Rather than these Jewish Christians being jealous of them, what was supposed to happen, do you think? Well, I think actually... The Gentiles' freedom was to rub off on the Jews. They were supposed to see that, oh, Moses pointed us to Jesus. Oh, the law pointed us to grace. Oh, we don't need that stuff either. We're as free as the Gentiles are. And that that was tough. I could get it. That was hard for them. But that's the reality. So, in fact, here's a great verse. Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, You Gentiles have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made us both one, Jew and Gentile and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near he's preaching to both these groups through the cross and he's going to bring them together as one grand and glorious church we know it today it's the body of Christ it's our church today But you can't look at the dynamics here and not realize that there are those at times who are miserable and they want you to be miserable. And their legalism, they just want you to adopt their legalism. And I asked the question, I haven't asked it in a long time, but what are we teaching kids in the church today? Do we mainly teach kids in the church today, hey, don't run in church. Hey, don't laugh in church. Hey, don't have a good time in church. It's pretty hard if you go to Howard's church to not laugh in church, right? And it's hard not to groan sometimes. I get it. So, so, so grace is a threat to some people, but you know, at the same time, truth is also a threat. Grace is working to preserve the truth. Grace is fighting really hard to say this is the truth of the gospel. But truth is also a threat to some people. I was thinking, you know, about this, this audit they're doing out there in Arizona, right? They're doing this audit in Arizona of the election. And it's really fascinating because... It's really not a partisan thing. Because if you watch the national news, you watch the state legislators, let's be honest. The people that lead the Republican Party and the people that lead the Democratic Party, neither of them want to do this audit. They do not. And they're doing a forensic audit. And I've studied up on it a little bit. It's really fascinating. It's extremely thorough. Where they take every ballot and they, ca- they, they examine every single ballot. And they count how many votes there were and how many ballots they have. And they, they, they audit, they go through the machines, expect the machines and the processes and, and anything that might have been going on in the, in the internet. And it's extremely thorough. And now there's all, there's like 20 some states have gone to Arizona to, to see how's this audit running. And it's fascinating. And you ask yourself, well, what's wrong? We audit things, all we audit banks, right? Well, there's one bank we won't audit. That's the government's bank, the Fed. (laughs) Isn't it funny how some people don't want an audit? Because sometimes the truth is a threat to some people. And I think that's even in our life. Sometimes the truth is a threat to us. And so it's like, hey, don't tell me the truth about my life. Sometimes scripture, we can... I I remember years ago, we would do this study, Experiencing God. And it was like a 12-week study or something, and it was really intense, and it would always confront you with issues in your life. And it was always the same way, that at some point in the study, like five, six, seven weeks in, you'd always find someone in the small group study just put the book down, and they couldn't work on it for a couple of weeks. Because it just was really like the truth was here, and it's like, hey... And most of the time they would come back and finish it. Some wouldn't, but they would come back and finish it. But that's just sometimes the truth. It's a threat to us. So here, I think it's fascinating here because he talks here in the passage, counterfeit gospels and false brothers can sneak into the church and they don't just just come in with name tags on and say, I got a false gospel or I'm a false brother. They just sneak their way in. And that is happening today. 
I'm amazed sometimes how I'm studying and God shows me things or I watch something on, the, on YouTube and it's like, boy, this really fits in here. I was watching a podcast from Alicia Childers. I don't even know her. I heard of her, never listened to her. And uh, pretty interested. She has her own YouTube channel and uh, she was telling her story. She was on somebody else's YouTube show telling her story. Her and her, her, and her husband go to this, move into a, to an area and go to a church. They find a church. They go to this church for eight months. Pretty good church, pretty good preaching, pretty good. So the pastor invites her to be a part of a small group, like a theological study. And he says, after two, three, four years, you'll have like a theological degree. And she's interested, and she goes. And the first week, the pastor says, yeah, kind of reveals that he's kind of an agnostic and not sure he believes what he's even preaching on Sunday. And she was kind of shocked. And it kind of took a toll on her faith for a while. Now she recovered, they found the new church and she recovered and she studied and now she's really heavy into apologetics and she talked about, she wrote this book called Another Gospel. And basically her Another Gospel, her counterfeit gospel is what's called today progressive Christianity. You may not have heard of it. Maybe you've heard of some of the people that are tied to it like Rob Bell. I remember back in the day I used to listen to Rob Bell and people would say, you better watch that Rob Bell. I think he's like, no, he's really great. I mean, before we were married, back when we were early married, Trisha went to a Rob Bell Bible study at Calvary on Dinah. He was a great guy. He's a great teacher. Now, I, I realized, I mean, I did get my eyes opened. It took me a little longer. But there's this one back, that they were talking about what happened to the emergent church. Maybe you've heard of the emergent church from a dozen years ago. What happened to the emergent church? And they were saying, well, they rebranded themselves that's progressive Christianity. And they had this quote from Brian McLaren years ago in the Emergent Church that said, we need to kind of really sneak into, kind of, that was the idea, sneak into the church and kind of season all the doctrines of the church with this progressive Christianity. And progressive Christianity, understand, it's just progress. It's just making progress. We need to make progress. Like, you know, yeah, the Bible's outdated. And we need to make progress. They said the one thing that all these churches hold in common, and that was her That was her counterfeit gospel. If you hear that term, you'll know what it's talking about in the news. But here's here's what they all have in common is that they they undermine the inherency and the authority of the Bible. That's where they all go to. It's like, well, yeah, the word of God's not inerrant and it's not the final authority and God is still speaking today. They often believe that the God of the Old Testament, well, They got him wrong in the Old Testament. He was angry and vindictive and homophobic in the Old Testament. And Jesus, he's a great teacher who likes to party and never judges you. And the New Testament gets God right. And we know they're the same God. And we know that doesn't describe Jesus adequately. And we know that the Old Testament is not described as they describe Jesus. And this is what's going on. And this sneaks into the church. And so you wonder how do these churches get to the point where they endorse gay marriage and they endorse you know, abortions and CRT and all the stuff going on today out there. And how does this happen in the church? It just happens gradually. They're making progress. And I thought about that. You know, the idea of progressive. And it, it, it's, it's true, it's in politics to progress beyond the Constitution. But progressivism, when it comes to the Scriptures, I thought uh, that would mean to move beyond Paul's gospel. Like, like Paul's gospel's not adequate. We need to make progress. And that's not true. In fact, I'll give you one example of progressive Christianity. Back on Father's Day, I couldn't believe this happened. I should have thought coming. I played, on Father's Day, I played that funny video from Matthew S. You know, hottest, or modest is hottest, right? You know, and, and uh, here's the headline that came out about a week later. Progressive Christian Twitter tries to cancel Matthew S. over modesty video. So they attacked him and they tore him down for his video. And can we not agree? Modesty is a biblically good thing and men, you need to watch what you look at. Both of those are true. I mean, come on. But that's the reality, and that's what's sneaking into the church. And I think the problem is sometimes we just are afraid that we're going to be labeled a certain way, so we maybe compromise the truth a little bit. And Paul's attitude is real real clear. He did not give an inch or a second to these false teachings. This is the gospel. This is the truth. And I won't stand stand for that for even a minute. One other warning here too, don't let influential people lead you away from the truth. This, this is just, there's these influential people here and yet Paul does not let them sway him 
He didn't care if they were influential. He gave them the truth. This is the truth. This is the gospel. And I'm not going to let influential people lead me away. I've always said that's one of the reasons why it's good. The pastor doesn't know who gives what in the church. You get in these churches and the pastor knows, oh, this person's super generous. And then it's like, well, I can't offend him. Because if I offend him or I offend her, maybe we'll lose some revenue and The reality is grace works to preserve truth and truth works to preserve grace and you can't have one without the other. Again, the grace of God is the work of God in our life. It is the grace, it's the work of God. Here we are, verse seven. Let's go on to a third example. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the uh, uh, to the, uncircum- to, to the circumcised, I got that wrong there, verse eight. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through, through, uh, through me for mine to the Gentiles. A little tongue twisting there. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And so Peter, James, and John, that's James, Peter, and John, those three, and they recognize Paul's ministry and that he's got a ministry over here to these uncircumcised Gentiles and they have a ministry to the circumcised Jews Two groups growing at the same time. And here's what I see is that grace can be seen in our life and the reality is grace works to show Christ in our life. Christ is our life and grace is working to show that Christ is our life so that people would see Christ in us. Above me and below me, before me and behind me, all around me, may Christ be seen all around me. And I think this, we can look at this in two ways. Verses seven and eight shows us that Paul had a theological identity of grace. And I use those terms specifically, theological identity, to understand that when we talk about our identity in Christ, it is based on a theology. It's based on the gospel. There is this theological identity of grace that Paul had. They understood, they saw in Paul. He has a distinct message. He has a distinct theology. And and so you have these two churches, and unfortunately, they're kind of like competing with each other at this point when they should be completing each other. And there, there seems to be this sort of this competition, at least from the Jews who are having a tough time here, and they need to not compete but complete. And so Paul has this theological identity. And we said last week, right, that Paul defined himself as being in Judaism, which we said was the same without Christ as being in the flesh. And now Paul is seeing himself in Christ. We said last week that, that the individual pointed out 216 times Paul uses that phrase, in Christ. And he uses it here in verse 4. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. There it is again. So Paul has this theological identity uh, rooted in grace. But here's the thing. He also had a practical reality. See, this theological identity in grace was seen in the practical reality of his life. Verses 9 and, nine and 10 talk about this. And when James and and Cephas and John, who seemed to be be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they looked at Paul's life and they perceived, this man's been given grace. And I think it's not just because he had this message, but because he had this, this lifestyle, because they could see beyond Paul's theology, they could see that this message of grace had transformed Paul. He was a different person. They had heard about him before, his reputation, his character, and they could say, that's not the person they used to describe that we all ran in terror from. Something has happened to the Apostle Paul. I was thinking even this week of of Peter's own personal failure and denial of Christ and how that even helps in this instance because Peter can look at that and think, you know, I denied Christ. I denied him when he was crucified and after the resurrection, God showed me incredible grace. And now he's showing grace to Paul who did worse things than me maybe, but yeah, I need to show grace to Paul as well. And he, he received Paul, and he received Paul's message and ministry. But I thought of a question. So if you were to think of the Apostle Paul off the top of your, your head, and you were to say uh, off the top of your head, uh, what, what was Paul's life about? And, and what one, two, or three words describe the Apostle Paul? I think we would say Paul was all about the gospel. And then if we described Paul, we would say that Paul was a man who was tenacious and committed and bold and impassioned and firm and confronting and demanding and outspoken. 
Many of us would not see that soft side that Paul had. The, the places in Scripture where it said that Paul was gentle like a nurturing mother or encouraging like a supportive father or faithful like a close brother or invested like a committed teacher. Or those verses that said Paul wept with tears over those that he loved so dearly. Hmm. We don't necessarily think of Paul in those terms, but I think they saw that in Paul. They saw this side of Paul that maybe we don't always naturally pick up on as we read the scriptures. They could see something that happened in his life practically. And, and then, and then um, we can see down here in verse 10, it's really fascinating. They asked him to remember the poor, and I think Paul and the leaders were sincerely zealous to remember the poor which I think, again, is evidence of the work of grace in their life. Anybody can remember the poor, I get it. Like my opening illustration, anyone can do a good deed. But I think what's happening here, it's the work of grace. It's not just the ulterior motives of, can we convert more people? It's like they really cared about the poor. There's a famine going on. You can read it in Acts 11. There's this famine going on, and Paul and the leaders were sincerely zealous to remember and help the poor. And I think most of the poor there were probably even fellow believers. Titus 2.14 again. Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. It, that should just naturally occur that we should be zealous to go out and care for the poor and to care for those who are hurting and those who are struggling. God wants us as his possessions. Remember 1 Corinthians 6, he bought us with a price. His blood. He wants us to be his vessels to do good works like caring for the poor. The truth is, grace could be seen in Paul's life. The question is, how is God's grace seen in my life? And how is Christ seen in my life through the grace of God? Because that's exactly what needs to go on. And what is my life about? And what words describe my life? If someone described my life with a series of words like they would Paul, what words would we use? Or would they use to describe our life? I get it. I get it. We don't always get it right. We struggle sometimes to respond in faith. I get it. People push our buttons. People get under our skin. They have a hard time showing us grace. I get it. But we need to stop and we just need to consider. Okay, ask yourself the question. Who pushes your buttons the most and where do you need grace to work more? Who pushes your buttons? Is it a neighbor, a coworker, a a sibling, a child, a spouse, who is it that pushes your buttons the most and how can I learn to show grace in that relationship? Identifying that will help us go forward. It'll help us in this last point too. The grace of God then is the work of God in our life and that brings us to the final three verses or four verses. When Cephas, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, Peter, Paul says. This is a different time. So at a later time, there's another encounter he has here with Peter. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And here's the reality. Grace works to expose our hypocrisy. Ooh, yeah. Grace works in our life to expose our hypocrisy. As I said, this is a separate encounter, and here's, here's what's going on in this encounter. There was a situation that arose when Peter feared the circumcision party and was unwilling to eat with some other Gentile Christians, and most think that this could very easily be like that agape love feast in 1 Corinthians 11 where they had communion. It's like, sorry guys, I can't have communion with you. And it's almost like they're not really Christians in Peter's eyes, and the problem is... Well, we know, if you go back to verse 9, what we learned, read back in verse 9, that Peter, James, and John all signed off on Paul's ministry and said, yeah, you were given this ministry. Those Gentiles are Christians. And we know from Acts 10 and 11, you can read that. Peter knew better. Peter absolutely knew better. And so he is called out here by Paul for what he did. He's called out for Paul. And so we can just note in this passage, Peter 
it, it, note, Peter's, uh, note Peter's hypocrisy. Peter was hypocritical and he was also hurtful. He was hypocritical and he, was, he also was hurtful. He hurt these Jewish or these Gentile Christians. He hurt them because he reflected them. Now one other thing here, let me note this. I, I just think when you think about what leads to hypocrisy, well in this case fear does. Fear can lead to hypocrisy. I think that happens today sometimes in the church, right? We're afraid, well, hey, we don't want to be labeled as, you know, being this, that, or the next thing. We're not, our church isn't racist. We're not homophobic. We're not whatever. And so what do we do? We run to make sure that the world knows we're not those things and we compromise the gospel in the process. I think that happens. It happens in our own personal life. We're afraid of something at work and it's like we compromise the gospel. We comprom- Fear can lead us to become hypocritical in our actions and our responses. And so we need to understand that, what's going on here. But there is something else going on here that's fascinating to me. A contrast, and I, knew, I didn't really know it, anybody else that kind of called this out as I studied this week, but I just thought this was a fascinating contrast. Look at this. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. I said to Cephas before them all. So you get what's going on here. Back earlier in the first two verses, Paul goes to these influential Christians in private meets with them in private, shows them grace. Here he goes to Paul, or to Peter publicly, before them all, and calls him out. So, Paul, what about the grace? Well, I think he's showing Peter grace. I think this is what Peter needed. And the fact that so many had followed Peter in his hypocrisy, Peter needed to be called out publicly. And he was. He called him out publicly. That was grace. One other thing, though. What about Matthew 18? What does Matthew 18 say? Matthew 18 says that if you have an issue with someone, you go to them privately first, behind closed doors, privately, and then you go to them publicly. What about that? What about the law? Well, isn't that the point? Paul's saying, Peter, they're not under the law anymore. I mean, yeah, the, the law says you should do that, and most of the time that's good, wise Thinking that that would be good judgment most of the time to go to somebody in private and go to somebody behind clothes and you know not call them out publicly, but we're not under law because there's something better than the law. It is the spirit of Christ and the work of grace. And in this instance, I believe Paul did what the spirit wanted him to do, called Peter out publicly. Yeah, he violated the law. That's okay. We're not under the law. <laughs> that would be hard for a lot of people today. It's like, no, Matthew 8, you have to, no, you don't have to do that. That's a good rule of thumb and most of the time you should probably follow that and you'll be wise and win favors like Paul did. But there's instances when you need to stand up and you need to call it out publicly as he did. I thought that was really just a fascinating contrast. One more. How about one more example before we leave today? Matthew, remember this story? This is over at the end of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, this fascinating story here. After some days, Paul and Barnabas let us, Paul, and, Paul, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Peter thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cy- Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, or Cilicia, Cilicia strengthening the churches. And, uh, and why is the story in here? You know, this story is not about Paul and Barnabas splitting up to become two, you know, two teams instead of one and it's much better there this isn't about them splitting up this is about why they split up and why did they split up because they had a disagreement about a young man named named john mark who john mark had been with them in the ministry and had kind of departed the mission team at some point and ran back home or whatever we don't know the details but he left them and paul's like hey this is serious stuff and we were out on the field last time and he departed and he left us I'm not taking him again. He's a newbie. He's a young kid. And so here's the, here's the issue. Paul and Barnabas are going out and Barnabas says, instead of two, let's take three. Let's take John Mark. Paul's like, no, I'm not doing it. And Paul was so determined not to take him, he said, you take him. I'll go with Silas. 
And so I just think, note Paul's hypocrisy. Paul's not infallible. Paul's not perfect. I think this is a great, why is this story? I think Paul God wants us to see Paul wasn't perfect. And Paul's a hypocrite. Because of all the grace that God had showed him, that he would not be patient with this young one named Timothy. And how do we know that? Because later on, about 15 years later, when his ministry is winding up and his life is winding down, Paul says this to Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, that Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark! Get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful for me in ministry. And somewhere along the line, Paul realized this John Mark is the real deal. He's very useful, beneficial in ministry. At some point, I'm guessing Mark and Paul apologize to one another. And where does that take us? How about our hypocrisy? I don't know, where are we? Where, is, where will grace expose hypocrisy in our life? And it will if we let it. If we're willing to let grace work in our life, it will expose in our life hypocrisy. And the, the reality is, for Paul, is that pride, and it's not on your handout, so what's not on your handout is that fear can lead to hypocrisy for Peter, and pride can lead to hypocrisy. We see that with Paul, and that's the simple reality. That person that pushes our buttons with all the grace that God has shown me, can I not show them grace? That person at work, my next door neighbor, the individual on Facebook that drives me crazy, my spouse, my kid, whatever. You have the grace of God poured into your life. Grace works in your relationships. Grace works in our relationships. Grace works to preserve the truth. Grace works to show Christ in our life and grace works to expose our hypocrisy and all of that's going on. The grace of God is the work of God in our life and if we let it, grace will show us our own hypocrisy. Let me leave you with this last story. Think about our inability sometimes to see our own hypocrisy and our own sin. The police in Oregon, this goes back, this is back from January of this year and I'm not sure exactly what news article this comes from. The police in Oregon are looking for a man who they say stole a car with a child in the back seat only to return the four-year-old and reprimand the mom about her parenting. Local authorities said the theft took place outside a grocery store when the mom left the car running with the child in the back seat. The mother left the car unlocked and went inside to buy a gallon of milk and some meat. The thief happened to walk by and hopped in the car. He soon realized the four-year-old was in the back seat and pulled back into the parking lot, returning the child to the mother, but not without scolding her. Police, Police spokesman Matt Henderson said, he actually lectured the mother for leaving the child in the car and threatened to call the police on her. Obviously, we're thankful he brought the little one back. The thief, the thief ordered the mom to take the child before driving off in the car. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> crazy, crazy, right? We can see everybody else's sin. We can see everybody else's me- mistakes and messes, and, and sometimes we can't see our own. But grace, it's working. God is faithful to complete a work in you until he comes back, and if you let grace do its work in you, it will expose your hypocrisy. It will, it will allow you to do something about it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace that is working really hard in our relationships. Working really hard so that people can see Christ in us. Working really hard to preserve the gospel, the truth in a world that wants to say, yeah, that's not the gospel. It's something. No. The gospel is Christ and Christ alone. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that when we understand that that, that's grace. We have the truth. We have grace because it's just like, yeah, there's no work to do and it's just like it takes this huge weight off of us and then we're free to go out and yes, we're free to go out and work in freedom and in joy, not just to, to earn an impossible opportunity. And Lord, thank you for your grace that will expose our hypocrisy, that will show us the things we need to see. Help us this week to pray that prayer. Lord, show me my hypocrisy. Show me where I'm not showing grace, the grace you have showed me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, have a great week. Will I have Sunday school in about 15? Yeah, thanks for coming today. Oh, I forgot. Yes, we have, sit down, we have... 
And then to do that before I started preaching, I forgot. We need to have the campers come out and share a word. Of course, we could have until Raymond comes back, but no, we'll do it. We have three campers here today. Raymond's already back at camp again. Heather, Heather wanted a summer off, so. <laughs> How many weeks of camp did I find? No. <laughs> so, why don't you guys tell us about your week of camp, and we will start with the oldest first. <laughs> okay, so what was your favorite thing about camp? Um, great time in chapel. Great time. What's, your, what's one thing you learned at chapel? Um, that God's works are beyond our understanding. Very good. God's works are beyond our understanding. Okay. Favorite thing at camp? Um, tubing and the prayer walk. Oh, the prayer walk. Cool. What did the prayer walk teach you? Um, so we had to do this one station where you had to find something in nature that reminded you of God. And I found like this all yellow leaf with some like black spots. They remind me how God is light and like there's some darkness in the world, but he overcomes it. Awesome. That's good. Anthony, your favorite thing about him? And you can't say your sisters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> favorite thing? The blob. The blob, okay, very good. Does that, that, that remind you of um, your brother, Don? <laughs> <laughs> so, anything you learned? One thing you learned. <laughs> you can think I'll come back to you. I got one more question. Do you have a favorite song you sang at camp? The Romans one. What, Romans one? You have to teach me. I don't know. That's fine. That's the same <laughs> thing. Same one? Favorite song? No. No? It's Noah? <laughs> I don't know the Noah song. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Give it a hand. There you go. Thank you.